Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Remember when we talked about the social construction of reality? Wasn't that fun? We contrasted this human scale way of thinking about the world, the social world, where you make up categories and then they're, they're based on what really happens, but there's a lot of freedom there. We contrasted that with the physics level, right, with the electrons and the photons, where it's pretty clear how you want to think about the pieces out of which reality is made. But there are a lot of layers in between the physics level and the social level, the human level, right? There's all of biology, for example. Today, we're going to dig into a puzzle, or at least an important research area within biology, that involves exactly this. What is the right way to conceptualize the world of species and populations and evolution? Famously, Richard Dawkins in the 1970s popularized a view known as the selfish gene. Back in the old days, in the beginning of the theory of evolution, you might have focused on individual organisms and imagined these organisms wanted to reproduce their own genomes, right? They wanted to have kids and have their genetic heritage be passed on to future generations. Then came the math, then came a way of thinking about population genetics that pointed out that you can pass on the genes inside of you even without you being involved if all of your relatives are very good at passing on genes. So it became not only Dawkins, but other people point out that it's as if it's the genes that want to pass on their heritage, not the individuals carrying them. In fact, you could say that the individuals are just kind of a bus full of genes. They're a vehicle that carries on the genes because individuals die, right? Organisms are born, they have a life, they die, less than a century for most species, whereas the genes can live on a very, very long time being passed from generation to generation. So surprisingly, not everyone agrees. Not so surprisingly, of course, this is a complicated thing. What is the best way to conceptualize levels of selection? This is what we call this particular debate in biology. Is it at the level of genes, of species, of populations, of individuals? And it's exactly this kind of how do you divide up reality kind of question. The answer from our uh, guest today, Arvid Ogren, uh, who's worked as a biologist on this problem, is he's actually pretty pro the selfish gene view, or as he calls it, the gene's eye view of evolution, but he completely admits that it's not the end all. Biology is more complicated, as we've often found out here on Mindscape, than something easy like physics is. There's leakage between the levels of genes and molecules up to organisms, up to populations. So there's insight to be gained by thinking about things from the selfish gene point of view. There's also insight to be gained by thinking about higher levels of abstraction. It's a wonderful real world example of the philosophical questions that we have about emergence, complexity, how to chunk the universe up into pieces that we can analyze and, and theorize about. So I think it's a great kind of uh, discussion. It's very mindscapey as I make the joke in the podcast, both me and the evil Sean Carroll, the biologist, who is a previous Mindscape guest, are referenced in Arvid's book. So it's a, it's a very natural kind of conversation for us to have here. Let's go. Arvid Orgren, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you for having me. So I think that we can assume that most of the audience is familiar with Darwinian evolution theory, natural selection, and maybe also a little bit of Mendel and genetics. But let's start with the groundwork at the synthesis of this, these two great ideas, right? The modern synthesis. It still boggles my mind a little bit that Darwin didn't know about genetics. He went pretty far without knowing about that. But tell us how that came together in the 20th century. Yeah, so th this is really is one of the kind of striking moments in the, in the history of biology, what has become known as the, the modern synthesis of biology in the kind of 1920s, 1930s. And, and as you say, this kind of came together by bringing two different uh, insights into one theory. On the one hand, it was Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, and a theory about individual organisms, Organisms vary in how well they survive and reproduce. And if any of those traits are uh, heritable, they will become more common over time. 
Now, the big problem for Darwin then was, as you say, that he had no functioning theory of uh, inheritance. And while he kind of had some ideas of his own, none of them really uh, came to, to work. And that remained a conundrum for him and kind of viewed as a weakness uh, for a long time of his theory. Uh, this was in parallel then with the second uh, insight that was brought to it, and that was a functioning theory of, of inheritance. And that was provided by Gregor Mendel's work, where we the realization that inheritance functioned with this inheritance of this discrete particular uh, entities, which we now refer to as genes. And so, uh, I mean, if, and, we, if we didn't know about genes and we didn't know about how discrete they were, clearly there's some degree of inheritance. Everyone can see that in hair color and things like that. But you might have thought that things would just blend together every time, right? And then that you would never diverge. Everything would just become some kind of homogeneous uh, unified organism or something like that in terms of you know the, sharing the same uh, equilibrated characteristics. But with discrete units, all sorts of funny things can happen. Exactly. And indeed, that Darwin, for a while, believed in this sort of blending inheritance and that the realization that you were quickly run out of variation for natural yeah. selection to act upon was a kind of serious issue uh, for him. Um, the problem then with this, this new theory of inheritance in, in the form of discrete entities was that how could that be reconciled with the gradualism of, on the one hand, vari variance as we see it in the natural world, but also with the gradualism as envisioned by Darwinian right. evolution, the gradual change over time. And this is really what um, the emergence of what we now refer to as population genetics, um, the idea that you can describe evolution as changes in certain variants of genes or allele frequencies over time. So that is what kind of what evolution almost has come to be defined as if you open an evolution textbook today, that the evolution is changed in allele frequencies in a population over time. So the change I, is inheritable. I guess I don't quite see how that answers the question of the apparent smoothness of variation. I would have just said that variation is smooth because there's a lot of genes and you can just change one at a time. It looks almost like it's continuous. And exactly, that is what the, the, the solution that population genetics okay. uh, found strung upon, and particularly the, uh, the English statistician and evolution genetics, uh, Ronald Fisher, showed that you could get the appearance of gradual variation from the, uh, if a trait was caused by many uh, alleles with small effects, you could get, you can reconcile the gradualism with the discrete inheritance. And that really represented this major achievement uh, that was part of kind of this generally synthesis of bringing together multiple parts of, of biology into one. And I'll, I'll ask you, genetics. I think you already explained it, but I'm going to ask you again to explain the word allele because it's not exactly the same as the word gene, right? It is not. No, so, so allele is a, is a version of a gene. So for example, we may, th we may think of a gene for, say, uh, eye color. But then you can have multiple alleles, like one for, for blue eyes, one for brown eyes, for example. Okay. So it, well, we have what we can say we have one gene for that as a human. We have one allele from our father and one allele from our mother uh, that we have inherited. So I think probably the person on the street would talk about a gene for blue eyes or a gene for brown eyes. But really, there's one gene for eye color and there's an allele for brown eyes or blue eyes. Yeah. Yeah, and then in, in most of the cases, you have many genes with multiple alleles underlying most traits most of the time. Um, okay, very good. And what is a gene? <laughs> ah. <laughs> I ask everyone, I ask every biologist this question. They, they always get uncomfortable when I ask it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's a practical little word uh, in biology that has come to mean quite different things depending on what corner of biology you are from. Um, in uh, kind of theoretical population genetics, it is simply something that kind of stably inherited, something that you can say affects a trait. Mm -hmm. um, to a molecular biologist, it has a much more physical or materialistic definition of it, that is the sequence of uh, DNA that often has a function or encodes a protein or, or RNA that does something. Uh, and indeed, these kind of multiple definitions of use of, of genes within biology has often led to uh, misunderstandings and, and uh, disagreements. So I guess even when we had Mendelian genetics, I mean, Mendel was still in the 19th century, but then uh, it was sort of glued on or incorporated into evolutionary theory in the 20th century. Uh, but we still didn't have DNA at that point, right? So, I mean, happily, uh, we have DNA now. Did that change the way we thought about this a lot? Or did it just get uh, 
serving as an underpinning for the existing discussion about genetics? I think the first approximation it changed a lot in, in what we think of or what genes are. We can study it in a completely different way. We have a sense of the number of genes that, that a species has and how they evolve. Um, at the same time, it is important to remember that population genetics as a, uh, an approach, as a, as a field, as you say, emerged before we knew what the material basis of heredity was, before we knew uh, that it was DNA, before we knew that DNA was a double helix. And those mathematical models that we still use in, in evolutionary biology were developed before that, before we had any idea of those. And there you rely on a definition of a gene that is completely agnostic about the, the material basis. And I do think it's rather remarkable that they work so well, despite being completely uh, ignorant about what the material basis actually is. Except that it let us invent a new meaning for the word gene, right? Like, so we had the word gene, and then we found DNA, and then they invented a new meaning for the word gene, namely a sequence of DNA that encodes for a protein. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, indeed, the, 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 the population genetics gene, as we use it, still in population, is much closer in a way to the original Mendelian yeah. gene, uh, as kind of uh, as it was originally. But um, it, it is certainly one of those words, one of many in biology that... Um, have similar enough meaning that people can think that they are talking about the same thing, but they are different <laughs> enough to cause uh, frustration. Well, you've written a book called The Gene's Eye View. And what do you mean by the word gene in the title of your book? Or does it not matter? So the gene, yeah, so the Gene's Eye View uh, uses the word gene in this much more old-fashioned way yeah. of simply defining something that's stably inherited, a part of a, a, a chromosome that's stably inherited uh, across generation. Uh, and... Uh, this means that it can be almost of arbitrarily long a gene. It can right. be as anything that's kind of inherited together, which means that the parts of the Y chromosome, for example, that never recombines with the, the X is a, can be thought of as one gene or kind of large swaths of chromosome, or indeed very small part of, of a chromosome. It's also thought of as a gene here, uh, but it is kind of this definition agnostic about the, any sort of material basis. And how do we know, how much do we know about the genetic composition of, let's say, the human genome? Like, do, does everyone agree that it's divided into so and so many genes, the human DNA? To, to, to first approximation, yes. Uh, that, that, I think everyone is in the order, same order of magnitude. You may, I don't know exactly what the latest number is. When I was taught it, it was somewhere between 20 and 25,000 genes. I think someone who, did, you know, did, with the latest updates of the human genome, you're going to find a much right. more precise number. And I think I'm sure experts disagree. But to first approximation, I think everyone kind of agrees that this is the number. This is all off, off topic a little bit. But I, since I have you here, I'm just sort of satisfying my curiosity about a bunch of these questions. Do we have differential data about the persistence of different genes over time? I mean, are some genes very ma malleable over evolutionary timescales and others stick around? Yeah, no, so, I mean, certainly we, we know that perhaps my, we have something called pseudogenes, which are genes that are still around, they're still recognized as genes, but they've lost their function in mm. humans. So, for example, my favorite example is that we have the gene that allows you to synthesize vitamin C from, from, from scratch, which is uh, present in most mammals. Yeah. But we, so we have that gene, it's clearly recognizable, but it doesn't work. We don't do it. <laughs> uh, it's lost their function. So it's in us, uh, some of our primate relatives, and I think in fruit bats that have lost that ability and carry this around. Um, so there it's around, it hasn't, selection hasn't gotten rid of it. Right. Um, but there are also certainly examples of where if you compare species that are distantly related, you can see that they've retained some genes in common, but sometimes they've lost genes or gained uh, other genes. So in my naive physicist way of thinking about things, I would imagine that in any stretch of DNA, there's sort of a chance per unit generation that a mutation happens. Um, and in those stretches that really matter to our functioning, uh, if a bad mutation happens, it gets weeded out, it gets selected out of the population. And in places where it doesn't matter that much, those can just continue to mutate away. So is it true that certain stretches of DNA maintain their integrity longer than we would think because they're really, really important to us? Yeah, and, and indeed, that is often how you know, at the heart of the methods that are used to estimate how much natural selection is acting across a genome. Mm. So if you think of all the DNA in an organism, we can ask questions like, how much of this is under constant natural selection? 
and how are much of it is evolving just by chance or neut- neutrally, as we say, which is going to be a function of things like mutation rate and population right. size, essentially. Uh, and this is something like how much questions like how important is natural selection versus evolution by randomness or genetic mm. drift used to be a quite contentious debate okay. in population genetics, but one that has matured a lot in light of the the abundance of data that we have now and is much more kind of uh, empirically informed, which is a much more uh, insightful now because we can simply <laughs> go out and ask how much of this genome, in, of this the genome in this species, is under selection and, and so on, which we couldn't before. And let me guess: the answer is that some parts selection is really important, and other parts it's not. Yeah, and in some <laughs> species, most of it is under selection, and some right. large swaths uh, is, is is not. And um, and am I right to think that maybe in the back of our minds, when we think about selection pressures, we're thinking about you know some species going out there and hunting and becoming faster or stronger and therefore competing. But really, a lot of the selection pressure is just that if you get the wrong mutation, you die or you're stillborn. There's, you know, it's not really that sort of detailed uh, capacity to get food or, or have sex or anything like that. Yeah, I think that that, that represents obviously a, a crucial part of uh, fitness for any organism. But there's so much more going on in, in, in the life cycle of yeah. any organism a lot of it is that we can't see or it happens at the right. molecular <laughs> level and often the, the those machineries are evolutionary old and often quite uh, sophisticated in kind of keeping check that mutation rates are not too high or kind of the repair mechanisms that are in place uh, well i guess uh, so is it, it again my naive physicist thing is every base pair would have a random chance uh, of mutating uh, and then the, the selection acts upon those mutations. But is it? Are there even more sophisticated repair mechanisms than that? Are, are there ways biologically or molecular biologically that uh, the really important parts of DNA are protected from mutation? Oh, that, that I, I, would, I, I don't dare answer that in, in, in a confident <laughs> okay. way. Um, uh, how, how that varies. So, certainly, selection is stronger on on, on important parts of the genome and i think like for example the that we carry around this gene for vitamin c where you can kind of accumulate almost any sort of mutation without selection yeah. doing anything about it how this kind of the efficacy of the the kind of dna repair mechanisms vary across the genome i must say, i don't know okay i would just I'm, I'm just wondering you know if there's in in quantum computing we care a lot about what we call error correction right or even uh-huh. classical communication theory i can imagine that it would be evolutionarily advantageous to develop a cellular biology level mechanism that would just say no no i'm not going to let any mutations happen in this part of the genome but i have no idea whether or not that's actually true yeah and now, now, now i'm curious too <laughs> okay good <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll bring you back if you if you invent one okay so i think that i completely interrupted you multiple times there while you were trying to explain the modern synthesis what is the modern synthesis at the end of the day at the end of the day the, the modern synthesis was kind of in a way the founding of the field of evolutionary biology as we know it today it is an event that brought together rather quite disparate fields of biology everything from kind of paleontology to ecology to genetics into one cohesive science, the science of evolution. So on the one hand, it was kind of this crucial event of showing that Mendelian inheritance and Darwinian evolution are compatible mm-hmm. and part of the same process. But in many ways, you can also think of it as a big institutional event. That's mm-hmm. when the Society for the Study of Evolution was founded and the journals and kind of the starting the emergence of evolutionary biology as kind of as a, a department in university and, 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 and so on. So kind of the modern field of evolutionary biology was really born in that uh, event uh, as well. It's interesting. I, don't think, I bet you don't always see, I'm just saying, again, I'm completely speculating. I wonder how often, I should say, you see a uh, parallel evolution of scientific knowledge and institutional support or institutional organization for thinking about it. So you're saying that in the case of evolutionary biology, they went hand in hand. I, I would think so. I, I've recently kind of come around to this view of that part of the history of our mm-hmm. of, of the field of evolution and the, the, the importance of the kind of institutional um, aspects of building a new field. Yeah. Um, and especially that this was, so this kind of perhaps happened then in, in the 1940s, which was just before the emergence of molecular biology. Right. And it was in some ways you can think of it, this is almost this assault on old fashioned natural history, organismal based 
biology, but it's more modern science, which was considered to be the, the future in, in kind of, uh, and um, the, the recently uh, deceased uh, Edward O. Wilson at Harvard describes this very well. And his kind of, when he was hired at the department, was then the department of biology at Harvard around the same time as Jim Watson, co-inventor of, or co-discovery of um, the uh, double helix, uh, and, and kind of their battles of what biology <laughs> ought to be like. Uh, and uh, Wilson described this rather nicely in, in his autobiography, uh, a naturalist. And, and um, uh, that kind of combined with that, we have recently had the 75th anniversary of the Journal of Evolution or the Evolution Journal. Uh, here. So it kind of made me reflect upon that part and the importance of people well, like Wilson. Yeah, and, I mean, it is really fascinating because, of course, we we hope that science gets at some true facts about nature, but we all know that it's done by human beings. And it's not just done by individual human beings, right? Getting support from an institution, having jobs, getting funding, all this stuff mm -hmm. matters in a really interesting way. And of course, the other thing that matters that happened, I think, around that time is math, right? I mean, when, once you were beginning to be thinking about evolution in terms of population genetics, population is a number, and you talk about the fraction of different genes, and suddenly a bunch of equations burst on the scene. It's very much so. And population genetics remain, in many ways, the, the theoretical backbone of evolutionary biology. Evolutionary biology, I would say, is part of biology that is perhaps the most mathematicized mm -hmm. and kind of population genetics um, often borrowed models from, from physics, statistical physics, and similar kinds of models describing changes in allele frequencies from how physicists had described change, motion of, uh, of objects. Uh, of course, there are other traditions. Evolutionary biology happily stole game theory from yep. political science and economics <laughs> and incorporated it perhaps even more successfully yeah. uh, as, as a way of, of, of doing things. Um, and there are also kind of other kind of quantitative methods, for example, in what is known as quantitative genetics, where you simply describe changes in phenotypes over time, for example, used in, in animal breeding and, and, and so on. But I would say the kind of the emergent population genetics and in during the modern synthesis was, was instrumental in, in some ways in making evolutionary biology be viewed as a more exact science and something to be taken uh, seriously. I mean, it's certainly true that once you write down equations, even if your substantive content is exactly the same, you suddenly look more respectable because now you have <laughs> equations in your papers. And you go, oh, okay, now you're doing serious yeah, work. Yeah, especially when, when, when you want to <laughs> convince others who are right. not share the same obsession as you are that you are, ought to be taken seriously. That can, can be proven to be quite important. And when we say that there is math, I mean, what are the quantities that are being followed by these equations. In physics, you know, we have the position and velocity of particles. So what, what are we keeping track of and deriving differential equations for in population genetics? Population genetics have typically been uh, considered uh, kind of the, the frequencies of a specific allele in a population. And you kind of, you can say, if you have an allele with these properties that has, say, this effect on fitness, uh, under what circumstances can it uh, invade uh, a population? So can it become more common as the generations go by. And also things you're interested in keeping track of are things like mutation rates, how often does this mutation uh, mm. happen, the specific mutation, uh, population size. Uh, so in large population, natural selection will be more uh, effective, whereas in, in small population, chance will play a, big, play a bigger role. Uh, if it's strongly advantageous, or what was known as the selection coefficient, so how how strongly is the selection acting on this specific uh, allele? Um, those, I would say, are perhaps the, the most basic parameters. And then you can introduce all sorts of complexities in terms of population structure and the relatedness between individuals, interacting uh, assumptions about the life cycle, whether they reproduce sexually or asexually, and how, how mating is determined, and kind of almost any aspect that you're uh, interested in. But in, in kind of traditional population genetics, these are the kind of the basic parameters of population size, mutation rates, selection coefficients, and so on. Well, that's interesting. I think we're, we run immediately into some philosophy of science questions here because things like the um, frequency of alleles or the mutation rate – 
those sound very measurable. You know, if I were a positivist, I would say that's good. I, I can see what's going on there. But then you have some kind of model, right? Some kind of theoretical uh, framework that it fits into. So you already talked about selection coefficients or uh, fitness. I mean, maybe explain a little bit more about what fitness is supposed to be and and how empirical are those ideas versus concepts we need to introduce to make sense of our equations. One of the uh, architects of population genetics, the, the Brit, uh, Jabez Haldane, uh, once described fitness as a bugger. It's <laughs> one of those kind of uh, central uh, entities in evolutionary theory. In, in many ways, you can say we are a kind of one trait discipline. At the end of the day, yeah. that is what matters. At the same time, it is awfully hard to kind of agree on a proper definition and even harder to measure in context that really matters in natural population. Usually we think of it as something along the lines of the genetic contribution that a given individual makes to the next uh, generation. So how kind of the, the, okay. the genes in certain individuals, how much they contribute to, to the next generation. Um, but then we also talk about fitness of specific uh, mutations. So then we talk about things at kind of at the genetic level. Um, we have um, a long debate whether it's best to define fitness sing only at the individual level or sometimes we have notions where we also should account for the interactions we have with uh, individuals around us this notion of inclusive fitness uh in, and then you even and this is even before we try to measure anything so right. but so if you those who study kind of evolution in the wild so for example you want to compare if you have say you have sampled individual plants from two different populations and you put them in in a third one and see which one has a ha have a higher fitness well, then you often have to rely on like, well, do, do make something like number of seeds that they produce or mm. kind of maybe even something like size and all these kind of indirect measures of, of fitness, uh, which means that it is this central entity that has been a lot of both conceptual debate, how we should ought to define it theoretically, but also kind of debate about how do you measure it and what are good kind of indirect measures, because that's usually what we have to rely upon at the end of the day if you want to study it in in natural populations. When I wrote my book, The Big Picture, I talked about uh, fitness landscapes a little bit. I talked a little bit about evolution. And when I ran it by some biologists, some thought it was fine. Others are like, why are you talking about fitness? This is a, an outmoded concept. We can't measure this. This is, it's one of the, they thought that it was one of those things that, you know, gives you the illusion of understanding. But when uh, you get right down to it, it's hard to really quantify in a reliable way that everyone would agree on. Yeah, I think so. Because often like to do it well, you would have to keep track of the fitness, not only of the, the focal individual that you're interested in, but also of others in, in a population in, in a way that's really quite hard in, right. in, in the in the in the long run, especially if you study anything other than uh, plants or um, <laughs> kind of things in, in in the lab. Like you can do it really well with fruit flies or, or microbes in a kind of controlled lab setting where you can kind of keep track of anything. But if, like I do, believe that at the end of the day, what truly matters in, in biology is try to understand organisms in, in natural populations it is much harder. Well, for one thing, there are things like floods and earthquakes and asteroids hitting the planet. And, you know, it's hard to predict ahead of time what your fitness is going to be in those circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Pandemics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so, but anyway, uh, to get back to the main line of thought here, we've mathematized a little bit of population genetics on the basis of the modern synthesis. And what we realize, it, correct me if I'm wrong, my, my impression from looking at your book and other places, is that um, it's not just about me and my offspring. Uh, in some sense, if what is, if, if you can speak of these goings on in slightly overly anthropomorphic language, uh, what wants to happen is that your genetic heritage wants to be shared. And one way to do that is to have kids, but the other way to do it is for your brothers and sisters to have kids, right? And, and so we get the idea of kin selection and inclusive fitness. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is an, kind of uh, an insight that, that appears perhaps in the, like, the generation after the architects of the modern synthesis, so in, in the, the 1960s. And, and at the heart of this is this English biologist, um, William Bill Hamilton, who uh, already as a, a, grad, a struggling graduate student write these two tremendously important papers, one published in 1963 and the other is a two-part like, majestic piece in 19, the following year, in 1964. Uh, and there he introduces both concepts, both kin selection, which is not a term that he coined, but it was coined by someone else, but which is simply the idea that selection involves you and the relatives around you. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But at the heart of it was his idea of inclusive fitness. And um, to kind of get a sense of why he thought we needed an update of the basic notion of fitness, you have to think of situations where the classic definition doesn't really work. And those often happens in the context of uh, social behaviors that we had, we had known for a long time that in social insects, like in bees and ants and wasps, you have individuals that are completely sterile and instead mm. devote their life to helping other members of the same population to reproduce, to be the, the queen. Uh, this is recognized already by Darwin, who described it as his one special difficulty of, of his uh, theory. Uh, and uh, what Hamilton realized, that one way to explain this is to think of that you shouldn't just think about the or- organisms, uh, the uh, offspring that a specific individual has, but should also account for other offspring that this focal individual is causally responsible for. And you should add those to our focal individual's fitness, scaled by the relatedness that you have uh, to those individuals. So in a way that if your brother has it, that counts for more than if your cousin does it and so on. The f- and that, then it also has to do this to do the mass properly. You also then have to subtract from this sum the part of your or the focal individual's personal fitness that someone else is causally responsible mm. for. And doing these kind of sums is where it can get um, messy pretty quickly. But that is basically the heart. You end up with this quantity inclusive fitness that you can show that individual can appear to maximize that. Then, under certain circumstances, inclusive fitness can be maximized, even though this individual does not personally have any offspring, but they can help enough others to do so. And then still, you you can have the process work whereby natural selection maximizes a kind of fitness, um, but it's it's a new definition of it. And this is kind of what emerged in the the 1960s. And and thus the witty remark from J.B.S. Haldane that he would lay down his life for two brothers or eight cousins, right? Exactly, exactly. That is kind of predates actually this, uh, but is uh, very much uh, sums up the basic insight very well. By the way, just for people who might get confused out there, two, I want to mention two things. One is uh, you mentioned William Hamilton, who is yeah. not the famous mathematician physicist William Hamilton, who lived 100 years before, uh, who invented Hamiltonian mechanics and the Quaternions and things like that. Two different William Hamiltons. Also, there are two different Sean Carrolls. And uh, there's a biologist, Sean Carroll. And I, when, I got, when I got your book, I think you will laugh at this. When I got your book, I, I realized that this is a rare book, given that you wrote about levels of selection and sort of uh, philosophical things that I care about, but also biology and evolution that the other Sean cares about. This is the rare book that might have both of us in the index. And uh, indeed, hey, yeah. there is one entry for Sean Carroll in the index, but it refers to two different appearances, and one of them is about me and the other one is about the other one. <laughs> oh, is that true? Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a very Sean Carroll centric kind of a uh, topic that we're talking about here. That's, that's what I'd like to see. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, we get the idea that the motivation for thinking this way, I mean, maybe the motivation is that it's true, but part of the motivation is we see in nature, individual organisms acting in ways other than just trying to have the most offspring as possible. And, and maybe this kin selection or inclusive fitness can account for that. Exactly. That, that is, uh, has been a, a tremendously influential way to think and make sense of these observations. Uh, it is also a, a, an approach that has been criticized from, from, from the get-go, often from mathematically minded uh, parts of, of the field and the kind of a criticism that continues to, to this day, that the way you, that you... It's not as kind of mathematically robust uh, of a construct as some people with perhaps a more mathematical strong background would like it to be given the centrality that it has in evolutionary biology right um it has kind of survived because it provides a tremendously powerful rule of thumb and a very something that kind of empirical biologists and fieldbirds can go out and try to guide uh, their experiments and to kind of cut this long debate short in a way my kind of impression of it is is partly what you want models to do in evolutionary biology, how kind of comfortable you are with these kind of mathematical limitations. Because at the end of the day, this kind of summing up what, uh, at the additivity or summing up what you are responsible for versus other parts of the population often is becomes prohibitively difficult in other, in other cases than the most simple ones. 
Yeah. Um, similarly, you have to make assumptions about uh, genetics and, and how strong selection are and so on to, to make it work. But it has pointed us to something really valuable. And that perhaps one way to sum up is, kind of, is perhaps the third leg of the kind of Hamiltonian contribution to evolution biology is the, the kin selection, the inclusive fitness, and that sometimes what is known as Hamilton's rule, hmm. that a trait will be favored uh, if the benefit times the relatedness is greater than the cost. Uh, which is kind of summed up in J.B.'s Haldane's I laid down my life for two brothers, right, cousin, quip. The, the cost uh, being that, that he would lay down his life. Be, exactly. And that as a guiding principle has been uh, very helpful. Okay, but the, I mean, I, are you alluding uh, to the criticisms by mathematicians in that? Are you alluding to uh, Martin Novak and Tarnita and Wilson? They had this paper about group selection and eusociality a few years ago that really stirred things up. <laughs> It, it really quite did, and in, 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 and I thought in in some ways quite, quite an exciting way. I had just started graduate school when, when the paper came out, and so it's kind of been with me um, your whole life, yeah. Ever since it was, it was kind of one of the, the first papers we read in journal club when I was a mm. new graduate student, and I kind of was really taken by by these kind of conceptual uh, debates and really kind of reinvigorated my interest in, in that part of the field. So they, in some ways, re represent the latest iteration of the debate. They are far from the first to make these kinds of criticisms of uh, inclusive fitness. Um, they were kind of made from, from the get-go in a way that it, given the centrality that is taken, uh, it's not as mathematically robust as you would want it uh, to be. Um, but it, it, it is a bit that perhaps has calmed down a little bit the last few years. And I think we are in the field, once the dust has settled, is better off. I think we're kind of more on the same page of what the limitations are. And you can kind of have a more, I think, a more interesting discussion about when can you live with those limitations and when can you not? Um, and um, kind of what the, the, the benefits of the approach are. And then I think I'm quite comfortable with biologists at the end of the day using different uh, approaches right. depending on the kind of temperament and kind of what they want the model uh, to achieve in a, in a specific uh, situation. But I guess I'm kind of confused a little bit um, because... The inclusive fitness idea, I mean, part of what it wanted to do, at least in principle, was to explain not only why certain ants don't reproduce and nevertheless uh, contribute to the life of the colony, but also maybe even altruism in human beings or other or other mammals and so forth. Um, it, it sounds like it is quintessentially mathematical, like, you know, you... you but Haldane's joke is is very mathematical, right? You know, two brothers or or eight cousins. But you're saying that the criticisms have come from the more mathematically inclined. Why is that? Is that explicable? Uh, so I think it's the, the that there are parts of the, the the concept. This kind of that relatedness is going to be really important. Is it and like kind of two brothers? Is in a way mathematical, but it's also quite simple intuition. Yeah. So yeah. it led a lot of kind of feel about like you can go out and measure. What are the relatedness between interacting individuals in this specific population? And the kind of studying that in a specific population in the wild, you can do it phylogenetically by comparing. If you look at this group of species that have developed this quite complex social behavior, do they have a population structure of higher relatedness? So in, you have interacting generally between more relatives compared to this part of this group of species on another part of a phylogenetic tree. Yeah. That do they have less relatedness among interacting individuals? So it's kind of guided us a lot in those kind of approaches. Mm -hmm. And that kind of like kin selection ideas there, I think has been, they're mathematical, but they're not that, not too complex in a way. They okay. just kind of point us in the right direction. Okay. Now to get inclusive fitness. So right to say, but inclusive fitness has to its proponents, one of a, a kind of uniquely good property of it is that it's a property of the individual organism that is and it can be modeled as a property that an individual organism should appear as if trying to maximize and this is good uh, because then you can kind of treat it as the kind of design maximand mm. of or design principle of uh, of evolution or, or natural selection that um and this kind of goes back to, to some part of evolution biology kind of the key problem that we should try to explain is the appearance of design that like the kind of the fact that organisms appear so perfectly suited for the environment that they live in. That's kind of adaptation or appearance. Of, that is the problem we should try to explain. Yeah. And you then take a step back and say, in order to do that, we ought to have a kind of a principle that shows like what should organisms appear designed for? 
And to his proponents, an inclusive fitness is that, mm. that organisms should appear at trying to maximize that. And you can kind of derive a model by which you can ex- get the expectation that that is what organisms should try to do, should try to do in inverted commas. And that is that when you try to get inclusive fitness to have that property, that it should be both what should try and be maximized and be the property of an individual organism, in order to get there, the maths is a little shakier in a way. You have okay. to rely on more restrictions uh, to either to, to get it to work or the, the assumptions are considered to be almost the opposite problem. They're too general to really become useful because you almost end up with this kind of truism where it's always true. But there is where I think more mathematically, even more mathematically minded people um, uh, have had its criticisms. Um, and I should say, all of these people are at you know the mathy end of the spectrum sure. within biology. But <laughs> you know, if you come there from a biologist by training interested in theory versus someone who has their original training in say maths or physics, and then uh, come into biology in graduate school or, or even later yeah, on, um, kind of t- degrees of mathiness. But and and so again, just to get the landscape as it were perfectly clear, is the alternative to inclusive fitness. Uh, or, or is the alternative to kin selection group selection, or is it more complicated than that? I'd say it's a alternative. Historically, that has often been the, the kind of viewed as the the two contrasts. And what does it mean, group um, selection? The, the group selection again is one of those terms that mean different things to different people, <laughs> and that is part of the the, Fun, the, the, yeah. the, 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 the problem. Um, and it has historically kind of meant two slightly different things. Again, kind of coming back to how we measure fitness. So by now, so so I say kind of historically, the first way we thought of group selection was in kind of what is now often even by its proponents referred to as naive group selection. Mm. This kind of fully that individuals may sacrifice their life for the good of the group, or even for the good of the the species, and that's often kind of done in a rather unreflexive kind of uh, way. Um, But then you often define group kind of group fitness in terms of groups producing new daughter groups. That like you measure group fitness in terms of new groups. Uh, produce uh, most today most models of group selection so if you just pick up a, a kind of one of the current journals and someone presents a group selection model fitness is usually measured in terms of individuals producing other individuals but that you account for some sort of group property some part of the group that's not really reducible in a meaningful way into individual level uh, okay. individual level properties that is what now these days meant by group selection I can sometimes think that it's a little unfortunate that that is came down this group selection, <laughs> but that is, you know, me and others lost that debate a long time ago. Uh, that this is what we've settled on as a field. Um, but those models then can 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 often account for the same things and often rely on similar kind of properties mm-hmm. uh, that, that a kin selection model would do. So one kind of observation or, or insight that in some ways calm things down in this kind of ongoing debate between inclusive fitness and group selection is that you can show that often they are kind of formally equivalent, that they they, they give the same prediction. Um, And I think that that is is a good thing to realize that often you have the the same properties. There's an interesting kind of, I think, more philosophical point there that often this equivalence claim relies on generating rather abstract statistical models that you get almost quite far removed from the kind of causal processes happening in order to achieve that kind of equivalence. And I'm, I'm kind of a two minds of this. Sometimes I'm kind of thinking, oh, this is great that we've shown that they're equivalent. Yeah. Sometimes I'm a little concerned that like this equivalence relies on such an abstract notion and that surely we, we are interested in what causally happen in a, a specific uh, event, whether it is better described in terms of inclusive fitness, which is an individual level property, or in terms of group level uh, properties but um, good well this is that's perfect uh, segue because I do want to finally hit the payoff here um, which is that you know once you start thinking about things in this way evolution in this way of population genetics and equating my life to that of an equivalent number of other people's sharing the same genome uh, that's when you get to the genes I view right that's when it begins to make maybe make sense that what we should think of as competing in the world of uh, evolution is different genes rather than different organisms. Yeah, I think the kind of the origin story of, of the genes I view, which is a perspective that kind of really comes to its own in the 1960s and 1970s, stand on the, exactly these three topics that we have covered. It's, it's a pro- approach to evolutionary biology that takes adaptation, 
as the central problem that we're trying to explain. It builds on the insight from population ge genetics that evolution can be described as changes in allele frequencies. Uh, and then the kind of the third debate from which it emerges is the one over group versus individual level selection, or the kind of sometimes known as the broader levels of selection uh, debate. And in a way, it kind of combines these three into one perspective, thinking that adaptation is what we are trying to explain. And kind of then goes about thinking, well, when we say that adaptation is for, for the good of something, what is that something? And the answer to that then is the, the gene, because genes mm -hmm. then are mm -hmm. conceptualized as these entities that are passed on intact from one generation to the next. Whereas the kind of the main alternative organisms or sometimes groups don't have that evolutionary longevity required to play that role. An organism, by this reasoning, is a kind of unique combination of its genotype and environment and, and their, their interaction is here in one generation, gone in the next whereas a gene then is passed on. So by this reasoning, the gene is the ultimate beneficiary of any uh, adaptation. Uh, and kind of lastly, it does this, kind of takes this insight from population genetics that evolution is this lineages of genes over generation. But because it very much kind of emerged out of the story, uh, study of social behavior, the kind of group selection debate, it combines that with a form of kind of anthropomorphizing or, or gentle thinking. Mm. I think if, if, if I was a gene, what would I do yeah. in this situation? And this is where it comes that we expect genes to behave selfishly and selfish simply meaning here, trying to maximize their own representation in the next uh, generation. And just to give credit where it's due, the, the idea obviously became famous and was developed by Richard Dawkins with the selfish gene, but the it was essentially the idea itself was already there. Yeah, so I think most of us learn about the genes that we have through the writings of Richard Dawkins, yeah. especially the, the selfish gene. Uh, ten years earlier, the, the American George Williams published a book called Adaptation and Natural Selection, which I hold as one of the most important books in, in evolutionary biology in the second half of the 20th century. But this is a book primarily directed towards other biologists, uh, on, who, on whom it did have a kind of profound influence. It, it really sharpened the discussion about adaptation and the study of uh, adaptation. Uh, but it's, you know, it had the kind of faith that successful academic books have is read by uh, <laughs> the peers and 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 on, but not so much more uh, whereas you know there are few terms in modern science that have had as the reach that that selfish genes uh, has had but as you say many of those arguments are there already 10 years earlier but they are laid out in an even more explicit and a much more forceful way in, in, the, in the selfish genes. it's a much better title come on <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's an incredible title. and uh, It matters, uh, right? Except that we're, we're still arguing about what selfish and what gene that's, uh, means. That still uh, works. That's okay. <laughs> the purpose of the title is to make people buy the book. So it's an incredibly successful title in that sense. Yeah, that you have to uh, admit. And just to be just to clarify what it means to say the sort of... Uh, I, I like that you call it the, the, the genes... Uh, sorry, what did you call it? I've forgotten it. Uh, the genes I view, you, right. Uh, uh, so it's a little bit, you're lowering the temperature a little bit from the selfish gene uh, way of yeah. putting it. But um, I mean, one distinction maybe worth drawing is that when we say gene here, and correct me if I'm wrong, we mean the instantiation of every single copy of that particular gene in all the individuals. That's the thing that is competing. It's not like the particular stretch of DNA just in one cell or one individual. Exactly. Most of the time, that, that is indeed what we mean. Um, the kind of the, in a way, the, the type, the, the gene type that is present or, or in its, all its copies in, in a population. And you think of that kind of whatever that is, is trying to maximize its own representation. Uh, it turns out that this way of, of, of thinking, this kind of gene side view, is, is very effective at also thinking of situations where indeed the material part of a specific genes are in conflict with other genes within a body, hmm. what is known as the side of genomic conflicts in, in biology, where kind of the fitness interests of different genes inside of an organism diverge. And this is kind of one of those empirical fields that really was um, stimulated by the kind of shift in perspective from organism down to the to, to the gene level. And one of the reasons why people got their hairs up on end a little bit, uh, and also one of the reasons why other people loved the idea, is because it does seem to anthropomorphize a little 
abstract notion, right? I mean, we Richard Dawkins and uh, no one else believes that genes have attitudes or have selfishness or anything like that. So the claim is purported to be that given this mathematical description of population genetics and kin selection and inclusive fitness, it is as if the genes are being selfish. Exactly. I mean, and the, the as if here is, is crucial, right. um, especially because, I mean, selfish is, of course, a very loaded term. Um, I think, you know, Dawkins perhaps deserves some criticism that this, the use of the word selfish, selfish even in the book slides a little <laughs> bit what I mean, because on the one hand, you have selfishness in terms that all genes are expected to be selfish, yeah. which and you can, you can say that if, if something applies to everyone, how useful is, is the term to begin with? Because you also then use the same word to describe individual organisms behaving selfish. I mean, contrast that with them saying behaving altruistically or right. uh, or mutual, mutualistically. And and they're like something that used slightly slightly differently. They, they kind of the essence they, 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 you kind of get it, but it mm -hmm. also kind of slides somewhat. And this is not even to begin with the kind of psychological motivations of of, of genes or organisms. Right. Where again we use selfishness in kind of daily language in a slightly though related kind of way. And is the genes I view or the selfish gene idea supposed to be exactly equivalent to the existing formalism, but just uh, highlighting things in a conceptually more clear way? Or does it actually make slightly different predictions? So most of the time, the idea is that it will be the same. That often, so kind of in the book that was followed up, uh, follow, followed the, the selfish gene, the extended phenotype, which kind of, uh, is the only book that Richard Dawkins wrote that was aimed at professional biologists. Right. Uh, all other books, you know, as you know, has been for the public, but the extended phenotype are for professional biologists, and it comes with it's fully referenced as you can expect a, a book like that to be. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, I mean, it can be it's a book that can be understood by anyone kind of willing to make the effort, but you get less for free yeah. uh, that you, compared to his other books. <laughs> but there he starts with kind of the, the, the this Necker cube illusion that if you draw a cube on on a paper. With straight lines, you can kind of often see from two perspectives which lines come um, first, so to speak. Mm. And he kind of would say that this, is, in a way, is the gene-centered versus the kind of inclusive fitness view of the world. That there are kind of two ways of looking at the same thing. And in many ways, that is the kind of prevailing attitude, I would say. Um, early on in the selfish gene, is written a bit more that like this is a kind of empirical rival to individual group level selection, um, kind of. But I'd say most of the time it's considered that it's uh, equivalent to right. inclusive fitness. And I do. There is an interesting kind of history about the relationship between the genes I view and inclusive fitness. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I can tell, the very first time that the term selfish genes appears is in the notes that. Dawkins developed when he was a graduate student and his PhD advisor was away on sabbatical and asked him to <laughs> step in and lecture on animal behavior. Uh -huh. And um, this is in the mid-1960s. So the, the papers on inclusive fitness had just been published and Dawkins wanted to, to cover it. But these are tricky papers to, to get right. So he had typed up his notes. Um, and then there he kind of explains the insight of inclusive fitness using this kind of gene-centric approach that we should expect genes to behave selfishly or trying to maximize their own. Uh, that being said, um, while Dawkins has kind of viewed Hamilton as arguably the greatest Darwinian since Darwin, he's also sometimes thought that Hamilton is one of those people who never really finished their own revolution mm -hmm. and never committed fully to the, to the insight that you should just get rid of the organism and go down to, to, the, to the genic uh, level. Uh, so the first answer is that yes, they're right. most of the time equivalent. I think the more the nuanced answer is that there is some kind of I think underappreciated tension between gene side view and inclusive fitness that um, sometimes um, I think ought to be explored more. Well, so I was going to ask, I was going to ask about how um, you could get new insights even if they were exactly identical, but but maybe I'm not clear on how they're what the tension is. You know, I mean, maybe there's rhetorical tension, but is there empirical tension? So the, I'd say the, the, the tension arises that um, the way we const if you want to construct an inclusive fitness model, that is a kind of an individual organism property. Um, and that often you have to kind of ignore things that happen inside of the organism that like that all the whole part of the organism share the same purpose that kind of has a unity of purpose. Yeah. Um, whereas 
So I've done most of my empirical research has been on these examples of genomic conflicts, so situations where genes differ in their inner fitness interests, where that that assumption breaks down, that you don't have kind of all genes working for the same goal. You have certain genes working for their own transmission, even if that comes at the expense of the fitness of the individual uh, organism that carries it. And these are kind of has this somewhat confusing term that they're known as selfish genetic elements mm. which is you know strikingly close to selfish genes but <laughs> here selfish genes is then used in a much more explicit way that they are selfish with respect to other genes of the same genome or indeed the fitness of the individual uh, I organisms okay. i think i see and so, here so the question is who are the genes competing with is it other alleles i mean the, the, it's the, the alleles that are competing so they are competing with other alleles in other organisms or are, if really they just want to pass themselves on who cares if other ones are also passing themselves on they might even fight against other genetic components of their own organism exactly and this, this is truly a weird and wonderful yeah. world and you, you have examples like so you have things like the meiotic drivers that so normally you expect that meiosis, so the process of production of sperms and eggs, is this kind of fair lottery, that you have two copies mm. of a specific gene, like in, in humans, and that each of them has a 50% chance of being transmitted every time you produce a sex cell. But then you have these kinds of genes that can distort that process. So kind of in general, rather than ending up in 50% of the, uh, the sex cells, they end up in 90, 95, 99% of them. And this can... They can then become very common in a population, even if that by doing so, they reduce the number of, of offspring or in, in, in other words, fitness of the individual in which this kind of distortion happens. And you have also kind of almost any part of the mechanism by which you copy genes and put them into sex has been uh, hijacked by some sort <laughs> of, of self-genetic element to, to, to improve their chances okay. of being uh, transmitted. And uh, I think these kind of things are make, in many ways, make perfect sense from, from a gene center or a gene side right. view. It's, right. it's often been considered kind of the, the perfect kind of empirical vindication of the uh, the approach. Uh, and I think this kind of em uh, the tradition in, in evolutionary biology uh, that emphasizes the individual organism too much, which I think I, I put inclusive fitness in that category often have to downplay the importance of this kind of phenomena too much for, for my liking. Okay. It's not that you can't use those approaches, mm -hmm. but it, in a way it's kind of a, um, um, m m m an issue of temperament, I think, or what kind of what observation you think are, are important in, in trying to, to explain. Well, it's interesting because I, I forget whether we said this explicitly, but one of the motivations or sort of paradigmatic examples in discussions of kin selection and inclusive fitness are ant colonies, right, where many individuals have no offspring, right, depending on what kind of ant they are, you know, they work for the betterment of the colony. And the idea being that their genetic heritage is passed down by them serving their queen and their, you know, etc, even though they themselves don't have offspring. And so this is kind of a, a twist on that idea where you're saying that uh, a certain gene can benefit itself. It's maybe maybe it's the it's the it's the evil twin of, <laughs> of that idea. A certain gene can benefit itself by shutting down some of the reproduction of uh, reproductive capacities of an organism, but guaranteeing that its cells or its uh, heritage will be passed on. Yeah, I mean, and at the heart, in, in some ways, you are faced with the same kind of conceptual question, and that you have an allele that is harmful in a way to the individual that carries it and you're trying to make yeah. sense of how can that ever right. evolve that kind of conundrum and like that happens when you have the evolution of sterility in, mm -hmm. in, in your social insects and in the, the situation of these kind of genetic conflicts or selfish genetic elements that you have the spread of alleles that harmful to the individual carries it and so how that how can we explain that evolutionarily uh, so to me there's always been that kind of um, conceptual kinship between the two kinds of, of questions and, and and even if to go back, okay, so that was a very very interesting um, example there. But even if the two views, like Dawkins originally said, are more or less equivalent, it still can bring conceptual insight if you have a different way of, of formalizing the same set of ideas. And so, by thinking of genes as the agents in some sense, uh, 
you think of all of biology as slightly different, right? I mean, there's this whole vocabulary of uh, genes as replicators and organisms as just the vehicles. All the organisms are are buses to carry around genes from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in many ways, th that is the central claim of the genes I view, that evolution by natural selection requires two entities. It requires something to play the role of replicators, which is how uh, information is passed on uh, from one generation to, to the next, and then something that kind of packages that and transports it around, and yep. that is what we known as, <laughs> as vehicles, or, and this is typically a role typically played by, by organisms. Um, but in principle, it can also be played by things like like a cell, like right. in, in situations like cancer. So that there you have kind of the breakdown of you used to have kind of thought, think of it as one vehicle. Now we have some vehicles that have broken out on on, on yeah. their own competition. Uh, and 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 in in in, in 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 practice, you can in principle, it can also be something like a whole group could be could be the vehicle. But you're absolutely right that in a way, like the choice of words here is important. That vehicle is kind of inherently a passive term relative to uh the replicator you kind of clear uh, kind of what is valued in this viewpoint is the become kind of the replicator and the right. organism in a way is downplayed and it kind of dawkins was part of formalizing this but it's also the the philosopher of biology david hull who kind of came up with the same kind of way of formalizing the the insight of the genes i view but he preferred the term interactor over vehicle because you think that ah. by calling it vehicle, you're downplaying too much of what's interesting about uh, organisms. Uh, to, so, it's, um, so um, but Dawkins famously said that he didn't coin, he coined the term vehicle not to praise it, but to bury it, <laughs> that he really wanted kind of the, the field to, to move its focus down to... Some of to my genes. best friends are organisms. I do want to give them credit for, you know, for doing something, playing some role here. Right. But um, it, it, this is probably out of left field, but that distinction kind of reminds me of Turing machines a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. the idea of some physical or even just, you know, Turing machines is probably uh, being too highbrow about it. Computers, right? Where you have hardware and software. Um, I've always wondered, going back to Turing and his machines, where he has an instruction tape and then some little head that goes back and forth and does the job. Um, how natural is this division of labor into sort of physical doer in the world versus instructions or information about how to do it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all physical stuff. Uh, so where and why and, and how universal is this distinction? Um, it seems, certainly seems central to the genes I view. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's an interesting layer to that, that Dawkins himself seemed to be very taken by computers. Mm, he was one of right. the first to kind of learn how to program a computer at the department when he was a, still an active uh, researcher uh, and in, in several of his books it, it, it does emphasize that gen the genes or dna as this kind of information yeah. uh, just like a um a, a cd or, or any kind of other storage and then the, the organism is this machine that on which it just it just runs um, there is a debate in philosophy of biology to what extent kind of the machine metaphor is helpful or not and in, in the kind of thinking of organisms as machines, it goes back a long way. And I think historically has been quite helpful. I'm I'm a little bit of two minds because I think there is something interesting about organisms. Because on the one hand, of course, there are physical objects just like everything else. As you say, they're subject to the same laws of physics like anything else. With, and uh, um, there's nothing kind of magical about it. So they're physical objects just like anything else. At the same time, organisms are physical objects unlike anything else <laughs> that they have this kind of like almost sometimes the, the uh a sense of, of purposeness or goal directness in them and I, this is kind of what's given rise to kind of by all this uneasy relation with teleology and yeah. like should how much should we allow ourselves to talk in terms of of purpose and that is something that, that really runs quite deep in in biology you can rile up even the most senior and sober uh, people on questions like this, whether this is an embarrassment that we talk in terms of, of purposes in, in, in biology, uh, whereas others think that it's almost impossible not to do it, especially when we study animals and animals' behaviors, that kind of attempts to try to use some sort of language that's meant to be neutral is not just uh, unhelpful, it's, it's downright um, silly. Um, and perhaps my, my attitude is somewhat that you can, there has been this classic debate that did Darwin 
banish teleology from mm-hmm. from from biology, or did he naturalize it? Right. That he did he make it okay by by kind of natural selection is a way that makes it okay because then you can talk about goals and purpose in terms of uh, of fitness, and in a way, kind of like I think of the kind of the inclusive fitness tradition in a way coming from that mm-hmm. naturalizing way that like here you have kind of something that organism ought to kind of appear as striving. Uh, towards so there's no magic here there's no land vital there's nothing kind of spooky going on but you have kind of allow yourself then to use a kind of language that otherwise isn't really okay in science i mean you don't really you don't use it in 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 in, in physical chemistry part of science that biology often looks towards uh, but biology i think straddles this that is on the one end is a physical science but the other hand is a behavioral science and it's awkwardly trying to balance uh, the two <laughs> But it's certainly, I think, the part yeah. of science where purpose enters into our explanation in one way or another. And I am on the view that we should just accept that, but try to do it in a, in a, in a formalized or try to be so kind of as formal about it as, as possible in, in the way we, we approach uh, approach it. Yeah, good. I'm, I'm completely on your side. Uh, I have hopes to write. I've, I've already written in, in various places toward the side that says that uh, – purpose and teleology can be naturalized. Basically, mm. I would say not just because of evolution, but because of the arrow of time, because of entropy increasing mm. over time. But to do it, I say you know, it can be naturalized. I didn't say that I did it or you know, we have a, a formal theory of it. And I think that that's something that is, would be very interesting to understand better than we do. Yeah, so uh, a colleague of mine, Manus Pat and I, just submitted a paper where we try to defend what we call license anthropomorphizing. Oh, good. Which is a kind of is a, is a concept that you should, you're allowed to anthropomorphize to say, if I was a gene, uh, I would do so and so. Yeah. But then you need to back it up with a with a model, uh, a mathematical model, and that is what provides the license that. And, and it kind of just goes back to the, the insight, this basic point that it's almost impossible to do biology without using this. Right. But, so, but we should try to do it then in a kind of an organized or licensed kind of way. And that we argue is kind of things like mathematical population genetics or other uh, parts of um, mathematical biology provides that license uh, to do so. I would say personally the same exact things about free will, but let's not get into that uh, Mm, debate right now. That's for another discussion. Um, Then there's that. Let me give you one more chance, um, just in case we've missed anything, to uh, give good consequences of being a genes I view genes I view person or selfish gene person like are there other predictions that this viewpoint leads us to or other perspectives that are helpful to biology so I think that the genes I view is a tr- it's a very powerful thinking tool in biology I think it's one of the best tools uh, we have to make sense of this messy world uh, but like with all tools to get the most out of it you must understand where it came from and what it was tr- what it is trying to achieve um, so it's an approach then to try to understand uh, adaptations and kind of the logic of natural selections that can give rise to that. Yeah. So it works especially well when those adaptations that we observe are kind of contraintuitive to the individual organism's point of view, which has been the traditional focus of biologists. So we've talked a little bit about uh, genomic conflicts, as I think is a great example of where that the benefits of the genes of view comes through. The others in the study of social behavior to understand the work of sterility. Uh, one that was kind of like a new thing that people really hadn't talked about is the notion of extended phenotypes. Right. So these are defined as phenotypes that are located outside of the body in which the, the genes that are kind of quarter responsible for that phenotype uh, reside. So kind of typical example has been the, the things that animals build, like the beaver's dam or the... Um, nests of, of birds so these kind of structures that clearly has a genetic component to them but and so in a way should be thought of as a phenotype but that the phenotype is not part of the organism so do my, I, wait do, do the clothes i wear count as my extended phenotype uh, so the extended phenotypes are typically considered to be to be part that has some influence on on the fitness of the organism in kind of a, yeah. a consistent way across uh, time and population. I think it's so, pretty clear uh, that how well people dress has an impact on their uh, reproductive success. <laughs> and it, it do, though uh, hu- humans are famously an aberrant species to, to study. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm just going to believe this on purely um, theoretical grounds. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, th- those kind of built structures of animals, I think that kind of okay. like thinking of, of those in turn from, from a genetic point of view, I think helps stimulate that. Also kind of um, individuals uh, 
where individuals of one species can manipulate the behavior of another. So kind of this gruesome example, like zombie ants, where yeah. ants who are infected by a particular kind of fungi completely change their behavior from kind of shying away from parts of uh, the, the planet where they live to go where it's beneficial for the uh, for the fungi to live and eventually kind of end up behaving completely uh, bonkers uh, because of they've been infected by these, um, these fungi. And here, so that, that again, that there's a behavior of the ant that has a genetic component, but the genes of for that four, if you will, if you allow us of that shorthand, for that behavior is not located in the ant, it's located in another organism. And that again is something that these kind of extended phenotypes are, I think, easier to, to think about from a genic point of view than trying to shoehorn it into that of uh, the individual uh, organism. So except, uh, let me let me you know bring up uh, that not everyone agrees, right? Like this is why you wrote a book, because there are skeptics and, and critics of the genes I view point of view. And at least, I mean, hopefully you'll fill me in on what all of the critics are, the most important critics are, but one of them is uh, that even the modern synthesis is no longer how we should be thinking about evolution, right? I mean, there's uh, horizontal gene transfer, there's uh, epigenetic factors, uh, the whole idea that there's just a simple tree and things branch off and never cross-pollinate has been become a lot messier in recent years. There's mitochondrial DNA as well as nuclear DNA. So it, is there any uh, legitimacy to this idea that the genes I view is just a codification of a very old-fashioned way of thinking about evolution? It, the genes I view certainly uh, shares a lot with the, the modern synthesis, especially kind of ideas that, that adaptation and natural selection are important and kind of framing that in terms of genes. Um, but there are a couple of things I think that are worth mentioning here. So one, that the modern synthesis is perhaps more or more diverse than what critics of it gave it credit for. That is often presented as this very kind of strict, dogmatic viewpoint, which... Yeah. It, it wasn't included in many different kinds of people with many different kinds of uh, views. Um, second of all, criticism of it has existed pretty much as soon as it was kind of codified or kind of as, as it became expressed that often of the, 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 the nature, I think, of people not really thinking that what they studied got the, the, the respect that it deserved. Sure. Uh, and uh, this has come different kind of versions of this uh, over, over time. Uh, I think it, it is interesting both... Richard Dawkins and George Williams, so the kind of the, the two architects of the Dean's view, did emphasize that they, what they were doing is was to kind of articulate the kind of orthodox view in a new way, that they kind of very much aligned themselves with that kind of traditional uh, uh, approach. Um, so the larger criticism of the modern synthesis and the Dean's view often is taken to be kind of the, the poster child of that is that biology has changed so much that this old way of thinking about it is no longer. Uh, helpful, right? And yeah, this is a contentious topic, <laughs> and 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 I think many uh, sensible people can disagree on it. I, I don't tend to think, tend to view this this new observation as being lethal to the modern synthesis in any way. I think it's modern synthesis is also quite a is a flexible framework, and evolution biology is not as dogmatic as even its internal critics would like to, to present it. That it's been quite successful so actually at incorporating it. Uh, we, we are probably putting too much emphasis on certain things and not enough emphasis on, on other things. Um, perhaps the kind of the greatest challenge, I think, to the genes I view is this notion of uh, that we ought to consider a more inclusive notion of inheritance, that we are giving genes too big of a role mm -hmm. in that, that parents pass on more to their offspring than their genes. So this can be things like epigenetic signals, methylation patterns, but also kind of cultural, right. forms of cultural inheritance, some other kinds of uh, maternal uh, effects. Um, so that, that I think there, there, there may well be some truth to. Um, one thing that I would call it like to see, I don't know if anyone has done, is that the reason why the genes I view proponents like to talk about replicators rather than genes is that replicators is completely divorced, divorced from any sort of material basis. And that it, what really matters is that it, it can make copies of itself. So I wonder how some of these kind of of the forms of inheritance, can that can that be incorporated into this kind of traditional frame framework? I mean, certainly um, Richard Dawkins is in favor of thinking about memes uh, as an important method of uh, cultural transmission. 
And, yeah, I mean, memes also, it's, I think it's interesting, is of course, it was coined in the last chapter of, of the, the first edition of, of, of the Selfish Gene. Mm-hmm. It was meant to kind of free um, replicators from the kind of association with genes in a way. And that was the idea that if organic evolution requires something to play a replicator and a vehicle, so should cultural evolution. Uh, I do, ironically, though, I think that the despite wanting to free itself from the, the material basis of genes, it is actually exactly those kinds of properties that that makes the genes have you worked so well in organic evolution, but not in cultural evolution. Yeah. That things that, you know, where does one gene start and the other one ends? How long is a gene? What does mutation actually look like or competition between alleles? What are really a lot of those things that in organic evolution, we try to downplay some of those kind of properties. But in a way, that is kind of exactly why it worked at the end of the day in mm-hmm. organic evolution, but not in, in cultural evolution, where those boundaries become so poor is that I think I think to, to, to lose its, its, its value uh, as, 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 a, as a concept. Yeah, a real biological gene is something at the end of the day you can hope to point to there in the DNA. Yeah, it's, it's anchored in some sort right. of material reality in a way that I think is hard to do in, in memes. That So despite being a very successful meme in of itself, <laughs> my impression is that it's, yeah. uh, it's influencing current study of cultural evolution is somewhat limited. Um, that makes sense. I think, I, I guess, and this is a good place to sort of wrap up, um, the part of the discussion that is that is most fascinating to me, it's taken us a while to get here, but it's the level of selection, levels of description discussion, right? Um, one thing that one can say, it's not a very useful thing to say, but one can say it is if I could be Laplace's demon, if I if I knew the exact state of everything in the universe and I knew all the laws of physics and I had infinite calculational capacity, I could just tell you what was going to happen. And I think mm-hmm. an underappreciated aspect of that is that Laplace's demon doesn't need to know about cells and genes and organisms, right? It just needs to know about the microscopic state of the world. Uh, but I can talk about things in terms of cells and, and genes or organisms or societies, etc. Is there how, I mean, this is a, a far too big a question to answer, but uh, say what inspires you to say, what is the right way to think about the different levels of description that we have to capture um, biological reality and can they coexist or is there a best one that we should focus in on? I think I, I very much come of the view these days that there isn't one best way to do it in biology. I think that biology is a kind of science that is so messy and especially the part of biology like evolution where we're trying to understand a historical process that we are better off trying to retain multiple uh, perspectives um, and that so I'm quite comfortable that some people prefer to model things in a group selection way and some in an inclusive fitness kind of way and sometimes in, in a gene mm. kind of way and that like that is not necessarily going to be a true answer that wh- while there may be one but I don't know it's meaningful necessarily to spend all our time trying to, to, to find that uh, that being said I think we ought to spend some time worrying about when we have two different kinds of approaches so one example is perhaps in, so in population genetics and inclusive fitness methodology. So inclusive fitness, you've often relied on these kind of optimization methods, mm. quite popular in the study of behavior, animal behavior. Uh, but optimization is also something that population geneticists rejected in the 1960s, that, that we should never ex- expect selection to optimize anything. That is that so things going to be in this kind of, may reach an equilibrium, but they're not going to be kind of optimized in any sort of meaningful way. So some part of our field has rejected it and some uses constantly. Um, and I, in some ways, I'm, I'm fine with that. At some time, I think we ought to spend some time worrying about it. Uh, but kind of on the, on the larger philosophical point, I, I think that we have, you know, as you, I think you have one reality, but you have many ways of talking about it. And yes. I think that becomes <laughs> expressed, uh, you know, very well on a day-to-day level in the study of biology. Well, I guess the complication or the interestingness of the question comes in because... Uh, well, for me personally, I don't know about for the rest of the world, but since some, as someone who is trained on pretty cut and dried examples of different levels of, of description, such as atoms and fluids, right? We can literally derive fluid mechanics from large collections of atoms interacting with each other, and we know that you don't need to understand atoms to understand fluids or vice versa. Uh, so there's this 
almost too good to be true simplicity of autonomy of the different levels. And I get the feeling I'm sort of slowly dawning to the realization that in biology and in the human sciences, that those levels are harder to disentangle from each other. I think I think that is that is exactly right. That you you have these kind of layers of descriptions that both can work really quite well. So kind of the quantitative genetics that animal breeders use, where you're kind of selecting on phenotypes and you kind of know that there's heritability because you can compare parents and offspring. But the kind of quite precise quantitative methods that you use there don't really care about the, the, the DNA sequences right. they necessarily. Don't yeah. They can be informed by those. And I think like, you know, with the advance of what, you know, sequencing and all that, that part has also been improved. But it functions rather well without it as well. But it's not that, to a extent, you can kind of derive those kind of phenotypic approaches from studying genetic sequences or vice versa is not necessarily going to happen, I think. Uh, and, I, and I don't really feel that pessimistic saying that. I think that's just kind of the nature of the, the endeavor. Um, so absolutely, I think biology is kind of perhaps where, where that kind of de- that you can derive one from that is starting to really break down. Well, uh, I think, in, but I think, I, think I, I certainly agree with that a hundred percent, but there, there's sort of like a deeper, trickier issue. I mean, I think that far too much emphasis has, has been put on derivability because outside the very simplest examples, of course you can't derive. I cannot derive the solidity of the table in front of me from the standard model right. of particle physics, but I don't think it's incompatible with that, right? Hmm. Um but what is important, I think, or not as what is important, what I'm, what I'm interested in at the moment is I don't need to know about the standard model of particle physics to describe the behavior of the table. There is an autonomous theory of it. And in biology, forgetting about derivability, it's not even clear to me that there's that, right? Like, ah, yeah, no, yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting point. I haven't thought about it in that way. But yes, I think that there, is, there is less clear that you have that kind of asymmetry. Yeah, no, I think, I think that is absolutely true, that you can kind of go about it um, I mean, everything has to be compatible, of course, with what's going on exactly. at the sure. lower level. But like how that, how you even begin to kind of worry about that, I think is less clear. Uh, well, I mean, I have, a, I have an example in mind, which is very contemporary, which is uh, the germ theory of disease, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, we can have a theory of how diseases are transmitted through breathing and contact and things like that without actually knowing that they're microbes. Right? right, you know, we don't need that lower level theory, but it is helpful. And so, I, I, I'm, I honestly don't know the answer to this question, but I would like to know: uh, is there some sense in which there is a self-contained theory of, you know, let's say, disease transmission that never refers to microbes, or if there is such a thing, is it so baroque and backwards that you should always, you can always improve your description by just allow helping yourself to the microbial description? <laughs> Yeah, I guess part of the answer might lie in that, but like epidemiological models are in some ways very generic in the sense that you rely on like it's just transmitted from one mm-hmm. individual to the next, but they can certainly be improved by knowing how it's transmitted. So for, like learning that uh, the, the COVID-19 virus is primarily airborne rather than right. taking around on, on surfaces improves models, I think, uh, in, in the kind of how you want to that they become more uh, exact. But you can certainly, it's not necessarily, you can do uh, sound models regardless of how that, ha- yeah. how the kind of transmission, what is most important for transmission of this particular uh, virus. But it's kind of where one part where the biology of it uh, matters or the kind of the, the lived reality of it. Yeah, I, I do think these are these are good questions we don't know the answers to yet. So, But I'll give you yeah. one last chance, uh, one final question. What, what does all this uh, bode for the future? of evolutionary biology. Like, it's interesting to me as an outsider to see the flare-ups, not just intellectual but emotional, when things like the uh, uh, Novak et al. paper came out about group selection or mm-hmm. uh, the, just the discussion around the idea of the selfish gene, you know, is, is, it gets pretty heated. Um, you, you've mentioned a couple times that data has sort of stepped in and and made things a little calmer. Uh, is that the future, or are we still in for, you know, a whole bunch of uh, heated debates in the pages of the New York Review of Books? Um I think data certainly has helped a lot, um, but there is also this issue that, um, that in evolutionary biology we tend to have these flare-ups over time, 
there, there, was, there was a fun paper published a couple of years ago called simply called "What Is Wrong with Evolutionary Biology," <laughs> um, and it's that uh, and the kind of the, the argument there is that they think they're kind of two things that evolution by natural selection on the one and such an abstract principle that it can kind of be applied to almost anything but also that evolution biology is such a diverse field in terms of what we study yeah so if you can't convince the paleontologists maybe you can get the molecular <laughs> genesis to listen to you if they don't maybe you can try the, the plant ecologists and that, that those two things in combination mean that you can always get a small enough audience to keep it going but you also may have a hard time yeah uh, explaining it like kind of convincing everyone kind of the chief thing that i hope to achieve with this book is to bring uh some nuance to the debate over the gene side view that i had noticed that one that people kept having these debates but also when i kind of when i was a graduate student i would ask more senior people in in my department about it you know you, go, you walk to one person and they would tell you oh yeah this is um this is the correct way to think about evolution <laughs> and everyone knows that and then you walk a few doors down and you say, oh, no, this was debunked in the 70s. And yeah. everyone knows that. Right. And I kind of, there was something there that I, I kind of was frustrated both by the proponents and the, the critics that I often thought that they painted kind of an unfair um, picture of what, what the debate actually is, kind of the strength of the case both for and against this way of thinking about uh, about the evolution. And so that's kind of what I wanted to, to capture really with the book. Yeah, no, I think it's great. And I think this was extremely helpful conversation for me in, in clarifying things. So maybe maybe whatever debates we have in the future, they'll be at least on a more informed basis going forward. So Arvid Ogren, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thank you very much for having me.